Hey friends, thanks for stopping by to visit us here at Cross My Heart Ministry. We continue our study through the book of 1 Corinthians this week landing in chapter 7. There's a little bit of a shift that takes place. Up until this point, Paul has been addressing problems that he's heard about in the Corinthian church. And beginning in chapter 7, he begins to look at the list of questions they have sent to him. This is the early church, they're new believers, they want to live for Jesus, and they have some very specific questions on what that looks like. And so these next few chapters will be Paul answering their questions. In chapter 7, those questions have to do with marriage and singleness and sexuality, a topic that is delicate uh, and difficult, but it's in the Word of God, and so we tackled it today. I hope that you'll stay tuned and listen, because even if you find yourself married or single or widowed or divorced or whatever your marital status, there's truth here that you need to be equipped to, to not only appropriate in your own life, but you may be called upon as a woman of God to share that truth with a young woman that needs advice and counsel. And when she comes to you, as anyone comes to us with any topic, our answer always needs to be begin with the Word of God says. It should never be, well, I think, or here's what I would do. We need to have the advice and counsel we share always come from, be firmly based upon the Word of God. So stay tuned and listen. I hope that you'll be blessed by what you hear. And as always, Cross My Heart exists to encourage women to love God and to love his word. Have a blessed week. picture on the screen I wonder are you old enough to remember the I Love Lucy show <laughs> a lot of you are waving your arms you know I realize that um, even if you weren't alive when it first aired and many of you weren't much less able to be able to watch it when it aired the first time in the 1950s you've most likely seen the reruns of I Love Lucy and you know when we think about the way marriage is portrayed in modern day sitcoms it has to make us chuckle a little bit, right? When we look at Lucy and Ricky in, portrayed and seen in twin beds in the I Love Lucy show from way back in the 1950s. And as we look at that, it may make us long for the good old days when marriage was portrayed in a positive light and when sexual intimacy wasn't paraded on the big screen or graphically displayed for everyone to see. And so it, things have just shifted a little bit maybe. Most of us would probably agree that what we see on television today would have been considered downright pornographic when many of us were children. And, and I know that you know what I'm talking about. But when we talk about the good old days, just that phrase, good old days, tends to suggest that there was a time that everything was good and wholesome and right, and things have sort of spiraled downward more and more and more. And when we, if we look at the 1950s and we look at that picture, we might say it's just spiraled downward. And I, every time I think we've hit rock bottom, there's just a new low that we seem to be hitting. But when we study 1 Corinthians 7, Instead of depicting the, the culture as spiraling downward, I think perhaps the better description would to say that the morality of the culture is more like a pendulum. It swings to one extreme and then it swings to another extreme. And I say that because when we look back not just to the mid 20th century, and I Love Lucy came out in the 1950s, the middle of the 20th century, but we all go all the way back to the mid first century because Paul's letter to Corinth was written about 55 AD, we see a lot of behavior in the first century that parallels more what we see on TV today than those than, than, than what we, we saw in the 1950s. So the good old days of first century Corinth really weren't so good after all. So those good old days that we talk about maybe, maybe weren't so good and we've just spiraled downward. Maybe they swing one way and then they swing the other. When we read 1 Corinthians 7 and we study what was happening in Corinth, sexual perversion was rampant, sexual immorality was practiced, there was fornication, 
adultery, homosexuality, every extreme imaginable. And it was, it was featured in the first century. It was prevalent in their art, in their theater, and it was even part of their false religion. So Paul is writing this letter and this particular passage in his letter to the church at Corinth to Christians who are really trying to live upright lives in a fallen world. They have questions about so many things. Beginning in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, there's, there's a shift. Up until this point, Paul has been addressing issues that he's, he's heard about, things that traveled to him from those in the household of Chloe and other places, and he's addressing the problems he's heard about. Now, beginning in chapter 7, he's looking at their questions. They've sent him a list of questions, and he's beginning to answer those questions that have been sent to him. And so, in a way, it's really refreshing to know that these first century believers genu genuinely wanted to follow Jesus. And so they had very specific, very practical life, everyday questions, legitimate questions, to ask how they could do that well and how they could follow Jesus. So their, their faith and their following of Jesus wasn't just something of head knowledge. They wanted to know, Paul, what does this look like lived out? And they asked some hard questions. And so ladies, their hard questions are questions that still resonate with us today. So as we listen to Paul's answers to the Corinthians' questions on marriage and signal, singleness and sexuality, we're going we're gonna to look at it. It's all there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And so always we want to honor the Word of God. And so I invite you to stand with me in honor of God's Word. I'm going to read just the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 today. Now for the matters you wrote about... It is good for a man not to marry, but since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Ladies, thank you for standing in honor of God's word. You may be seated. And would you just pray with me as we begin? Father, today we come to a passage of scripture that is, is difficult. It's, it's a delicate topic. It's one that brings perhaps up no small degree of pain for some of us in this room. So wherever we are, whatever view we come from, whatever our marital status today, Father, I just pray that the truth of Scripture today would be presented in a way that is loving and filled with grace but does not compromise the Word of God. Holy Spirit, teach us today. And Father, we pray that you would be glorified in all that is shared and thought and, and that as we walk out of here, we would appropriate the truth that we learn for our good and for your glory. Amen. Well, ladies, before we jump into unpacking the text, I just felt like it was necessary on this very delicate and difficult subject as I prayed to sort of establish a couple of ground rules. And so as we talk about this teaching on marriage and singleness and sexuality, I just first want to say that this is for all of us. Some of you today come here today and you are married, and some of you today come here today and you're single. Some of you are married, and, and if you were honest, maybe wish you weren't, and some of you are single, and if you were honest, would say you wish you weren't. Uh, some of you are divorced, and, and, and there's a lot of pain that comes with that. Some of you have been widowed, and there's pain with that. Some of you were widowed way too soon, and some of you, that's a very fresh, raw reality. So... You, some of you, even though you're not married now, you, you might be married someday. Even though you're not single now, you might be single someday. But even over all of that, in spite of whatever our marital status is, I just want to step back and look at the big picture and remind us that as women of God, we need to know what the Bible says. 
And we need to be able to articulate truth on a variety of subjects that the Bible covers. In this case, the subject is marriage and sexuality. As women of God, you may find yourself, we may find ourselves in a position where someone wants our opinion. We may be, find ourselves at a, a little, little luncheon someplace or sitting at a soccer field and a heavy topic comes up and someone may catch you off guard perhaps and say, well, what do you think? You may be called upon by a neighbor or a daughter or a granddaughter or a new believer and she may want, she may have questions just like the Corinthians had questions for Paul. You may be sought out as a woman of God. Well, what do you think? Can you answer these questions for me? And ladies, I pray that every single one of us, as women of God, who are ever called upon to give an answer, that our answer never, ever begins, well, I think, or well, I would, but we always humbly hold up the word of God. Even if we don't have it with us to hold up, in our minds, our posture is, is always what the Bible says or God says, this is the source of any wisdom we share. It's not my truth and your truth or what I think or what you think. We always need to be ready to give an answer for what does God's word say. And so that's why we study this today. It may not apply to you specifically, but you may be called upon to give an answer. Paul's teaching applies to all of us as women of God who may be called upon to give an answer at some point. This teaching is, is on marriages for all of us. It's also not to shame us. It's not to shame us. It's not to bring on guilt or hurt. The purpose here, that is not the purpose here. What I would say is that God's ways are best in all areas. And if we could keep the Ten Commandments, we would all be much better women. God's word is, protects us. It's for our health. A, a lady at our table that I sat in this morning even, even has read a book that talks about all the diseases that keeping the law has protected us from. Who would have thought that such a book and such a study would have been done? Very interesting. But the reality is that if we follow God's ways, he's the creator. It, it, it's like having a manual for your car and reading that manual and if it says change the oil every three months or five, 4,000 miles or whatever in this many quarts, your car is going to run best and optimally if you do what the creator of that engine told you to do. We would be much more content and much more blessed if we would do what God's word says. And so in the bigger context, we break all of it because we're broken sinners but the, I, don't want to, I want us to put this in context of not just seeing us as blowing it in some ways with marriage, but the Bible tells us to worship God. It says to have no other gods before him. But yet, I've been found guilty of running to chocolate to medicate my pain when my feelings are hurt. The Bible commands us not to bear false witness. But is there a mother here who has ever told a toddler, we don't have any ice cream? Because it's just easier to say that than to argue about whether or not they can have any. The Bible commands us to honor our parents. And yet, have you ever gossiped to a sibling about an irritation with your mother? Or have you become impatient when your parents needed help? Or have you just failed to call your mother or to call your parents? Is that a way of honoring? And so I would just say call your mother. You know, and, and you, when you get to be my age, you realize how fabulous it is to look and see one of your adult children's name on the caller ID. And it makes me sort of a shame that I wasn't more faithful to call my own mother back in the day. The Bible commands us to not covet, but yet have we ever run out and bought something just because somebody else had it? Because we saw somebody put something on Facebook that they had whatever, so we had to have it too. And the Bible tells us not to commit adultery, but yet some of us may have done that. It may have been done to us. And so we just need to put this in the context of all of it. You know, we're broken. We've, we've broken many of God's laws. We're not trying to single out any one thing, but this is the topic that we come to today as we go verse by verse through 1 Corinthians. This teaching is not to shame us. It's not to dredge up pain. The Bible, all of it, functions as a mirror revealing our imperfections and showing us yet again our need for a Savior. If we could keep the law, if we could keep God's commands, all of them, well, Jesus would not have had to endure the cross. But we can't. We're broken, and we, we need him. This teaching is not presented to shame us, but it's presented really to show us and to remind us that the gospel redeems us, and we desperately need the gospel. We've all sinned. 
we all fall short. We fall far short of the glory of God. Some in the area of marriage, some in other areas, but the awareness of where we have failed or where others have failed us always takes us back to the gospel. It takes us back to the foot of the cross with such profound gratefulness, makes us so thankful for the grace of God. And finally, this teaching on marriage instructs us about God's way versus the culture's way. God's way versus the culture's way. You know, it's easy in many areas, including marriage and sexuality, to look at the Bible through the lens of the culture. To sort of let our favorite television show or TV host or blog or whatever have us look at the Bible and feel like a little defensive or a little embarrassed or a little ashamed or whatever. But as women of God, we have to live counter to the culture. We have to look at the culture through the lens of the Bible. This has to be front and center before our eyes. We need to look through everything else we see through the truth that is found here. And that's why it's so important to be committed to God's word, to come here and let iron sharpen iron, to become women of the word so that we're equipped to look at the culture through that lens of the Bible. In today's text, Paul is answering the questions from first century believers who were struggling to live for Jesus in a sex-crazed culture. Does that sound a little familiar? Being a believer struggling to live for Jesus in a sex-crazed culture? And so as we look at Paul's answers, we can almost anticipate or think about what some of their questions most likely were. And here's a list that, that I've sort of compiled. These were perhaps, most likely, possibly, some of the questions they ask. Now that we're Christians, should we refrain from sexual intimacy with our spouse? Is it better to stay single? Are Christians supposed to get married? If my spouse is not a believer, should I get a divorce? Now, some of these might seem like odd questions to us all these years later, but these were real, legitimate questions to these first century believers, and we know that because we see Paul's answers. Now, 1 Corinthians 7 is not a complete theology on marriage. If you're doing a study on marriage, there are other passages that you would need to look at. Most likely Ephesians 5, also written by Paul, but also the Gospels. Jesus addressed marriage many times, so go back to the Gospels and look at those red letters. So if you want to study on marriage, this is not the only place to look at it, but this is this, the passage that we're studying today. Paul's answers to their questions can be summarized into three categories. He answers to those believers who are married to believers. He has answers for them. He has answers for believers married to unbelievers. And then he has answers for believers who are unmarried. If you are a woman of God who, is, who has committed your life to Jesus Christ and you are a believer, then you fall into one of these three categories today. One of these describes who you are. Every one of us falls into here. And so here's what Paul tells us about marriage in 1 Corinthians 7. First of all, he says it's between a man and a woman. One man and one woman. That's what the Word of God says. That's not Laura's opinion. This is the Word of the Lord. Verse 2 says, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. So that makes it clear that some things are excluded. Polygamy is outside of God's plan for marriage. It also makes it clear that homosexuality is outside of God's plan for marriage. This teaching and this truth, this belief, certainly not going to make us popular in the 21st century and not going to make us politically correct. But it is what the Bible teaches. It is the word of God. Sin is sin in God's economy. Sin breaks God's heart. Sin separates us from God. And in God's economy, he doesn't classify sin as misdemeanors and felonies. Sin hurts us. Sin compromises us. Sin is not good for us. And sin separates us from God Almighty. God wants us to choose to obey him, but he doesn't force us. We, when we strain and push against the good, healthy boundaries that he has for us, he doesn't jerk us back. He doesn't have a collar around our neck that he zaps us. Sometimes he just lets us go and, and wallow in it. You know, in the Old Testament, for marriage, the patriarchs were, were allowed to have multiple wives. And sometimes Moses wrote that law that allowed them to get a certificate of divorce. But it doesn't mean that was God's best. We know that it wasn't. When we remove and we reject God from the equation, and we do it our own way, we choose to create our own truth, the results 
are most often devastating. And we know that, not just in this area, but in other areas of sin. It, it, it rivets, it, it, it sort of rolls out, it affects not just us, it affects our families, um, our extended families, society as a whole, even our nation. We look at Abraham, the father Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith. Look what happened when he and Sarah concocted that mess to not wait on Isaac to come and wait on God's blessing, but just go sleep with my handmaiden. And, and then Ishmael was the result. And look how, that, look how that mess turned out. All these years later, centuries later, still the conflict in the Middle East with Arab against Jew, all because of that sinful behavior. Sin brings consequences, and often not just to us. The thing about it is, Every sin that we choose to embrace will eventually consume us. It'll consume us. We've got to fight it. More, it becomes more and more necessary when you embrace that sin and stroke it and it becomes your little pet. It, you have to keep pushing the boundary, whether it's drug abuse or alcohol abuse or shopping abuse or sex, whatever. Pick, pick it. It doesn't matter what the sin is. If you indulge, you're going to need more and more to get satisfied. It, it may be exciting the first time, but not the second or the third time. It, it, there's going to be an increasing giving over of ourselves to that sin until it completely owns us. It's like a fire. It's never enough. Every experience spurs on more frenzy. So whether you're, you're besetting sin, whatever your besetting sin is, gambling, alcohol, I listed a few of those, it's just going to crave more and more. It's going to demand more and more until it owns you, because that's what sin does. It's destructive and it's addictive. And sexual sin is no different. It's, it's the same way. Only God. We cannot find our identity in, in, in sin. Only God can provide the satisfaction, the contentment, the freedom, and the peace that's really what we crave. We can't find it in another person. We can't find it in a habit or a hobby or anything we buy or own. The joy and the peace that we desperately long for can only be found in the person of Jesus Christ. The sin of homo homosexuality has become so increasingly, I would say it's almost moving beyond being controversial in our culture because it's become so readily accepted and become accepted in, in mainstream. But, but Paul makes it clear. And with tears in my eyes, in, but, but truth, I just want to say to you as women of God that... 1 Corinthians 7 makes it clear that marriage is between a man and a woman. But this is not the only place. Paul addressed homosexuality over in the book of Romans. We studied this a couple of years ago. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 says, Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even though women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones, in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their, for their error. This is in scripture. This is in the word of God. And you know the things that's very, that's very interesting about this passage. Paul was writing this letter to the Christians in Rome. But do you know where he was when he was writing it? He was in Corinth. He was in Corinth sitting there maybe not typing on his computer at his desk, probably dictating to a scribe that was taking notes, but he's sitting there in Corinth. He could look out his window and see all this sin that he's writing about. He was in Corinth at ground zero when he was writing this letter to the Romans. All sex outside of marriage taints, distorts God's best for us. Homosexuality is a sin, but so is adultery, and so is premarital sex, and so is pornography, and every other sexual sin, and every other sin in general. All of it is harmful to us. Christians, when it comes to homosexuality, I believe have accepted two lies. And I'm just going to call these the liberal lie and the conservative lie. And I think, I think if we have a distorted view of homosexuality, we fall into one of these. Number one, the liberal one chooses to excuse or to reinterpret scripture. Um, and usually someone adopts this be belief as a Christian because someone they love has fallen into this lifestyle. And you can't imagine not loving this person. And so you decide to just rewrite what, the, what God's word says. And, and so a, a, a liberal believing Christian might say, well, God just made some people this way. God wants everyone to be happy. God just wants us to love. The conservative view 
wants to sort of single this out as the worst of all possible sins and, and wants to sort of banish homosexual, homosexuals and say, you're so far gone that the gospel cannot reach you. And that's also wrong. Of course that's wrong. Both views are absolutely wrong. Ladies, we diminish or water down the gospel when we fail to take sin, sin seriously, but we also diminish or water down the gospel when we fail to declare that it is sufficient for all people and that, that it can't cover all sin. And so the question is, to those in our world, to those in our community, in our neighborhood, and even our family, is how do we respond? How do we live upright in this fallen down world? And so what, what should our response be? Do we, do we excuse or accept or somehow redefine what, what scripture teaches about sin? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not ready to get at my scissors and start cutting out the pages of scripture that make me uncomfortable or are inconsistent with what the culture is telling me is true. All of scripture is God's word breathed for us. Or number two, do we decide that we're going to single out one sin as more sinful than all the others? Because we need to remind ourselves that right up there with homosexuality, there are other sins that, that we step into. Greed, selfishness, gossip, envy, those are on the list too. The old-fashioned phrase, hate the sin and love the sinner, still rings true. We hate the lie, but we love the liar. We hate the greed, but we love the greedy. We hate the gossip, but we love the gossiper. And we hate the homosexuality, but we love the homosexual. Hate the sin, love the sinner, a good rule to live by. And so we just sort of humbly look in the mirror, and I, and I look at you and say, hello, my name is Laura and I am a sinner. I am a sinner, but I've been saved by grace through Jesus Christ by placing my faith in him. We all have a problem. We are all broken by sin, and we don't fix that by redefining what sin is. Only our great God, and only our great God alone can fix what is broken. Marriage is defined by the Bible as between one man and one woman. And marriage also, Paul tells us, should include sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy is needed in the context of marriage. Now, we're leaning into the awkward here, ladies, but we just have to cover it as it comes in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 7.3 says the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The believers in Corinth... <clears throat> the believers in Corinth were living in a society where sex was extreme, and it was just anything goes, and if it feels good, do it, and I know that sounds familiar. Um, that attitude didn't just show up in the modern world. It was there in the first century as well. There's nothing new under the sun. How many times have we said that as we've studied 1 Corinthians? They saw sex perverted in their culture, and say so they just ask, is it better to just abstain altogether? If we just avoid sex, is that the way that we protect ourselves from becoming that? And so that was their question. And remember, I think believers in the first century really thought Jesus was going to be coming back a lot sooner. I think they would have been very surprised to know that 2,000 years has gone by and he has still tarried. So they ask him, should we just abstain altogether? Is that the best way to hedge ourselves in and protect ourselves? But Paul makes it clear that sexual intimacy within the confines of marriage is not only appropriate, but it's to be encouraged. Now, if you go home and you're married and you tell your husband I said that, he might start suggesting we have Bible study every day of the week. I was just, <laughs> just occurs to me. But anyway, he went on to say in verse 5, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So he gives one exception, and it's for temporary abstinence. And he says it's a time devoted to prayer. But he makes it clear this is mutual consent, and it should be for a set time. And so, you know, we, it, it, it's a topic that's uncomfortable. It's a topic that's delicate. But as Paul puts this in Scripture, as God inspires Paul to put this in Scripture, it occurs to me that we as women often in our marriage relationships, we're longing for emotional and relational and conversational, conversational, conversational 
intimacy with our husbands, but we're holistic beings and so are they. And so if we neglect one area of, of connection with our husband, it, it diminishes the others. And if we are connecting with them on all these healthy levels, including embracing sexual intimacy, then we, we just find that our conversations are also more intimate. And, and it's just a healthier way to live, to, to find that connection. So I intentionally skip verse 4, and I want to cycle back to verse 4 now. I spend a lot of time camping out here, and I just saw one word even in this verse that gave me a lot to lean into praying over this week. 1 Corinthians verse 4 says, The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. And in the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. The husband belongs to the wife, and the wife belongs to the husband. And the word that I just kept looking at was the word belong. What does it mean for me to belong to Kevin, for him to belong to me? And then it occurred to me, ladies, this is first century. This is first century. This isn't 21st century. The, the, the women's liberation movement hasn't come yet. In the first century, women didn't have rights. They were chattel. They were property. Their testimony was not even permitted to be spoken in a court of law. They, they were nothing. This was extraordinary, to, to this, this huge elevation of the status of women. According to Paul, the husband and the wife are equal partners in marriage, each belonging to the other. So it, it sort of encouraged me. I, I know Paul sort of sometimes gets a bad rap. People accuse him of being anti-women. But verse 4 tells us, he says, husband and wife are equal partners. The marriage and the marriage bed are to honor both. And so this idea of belonging to each other creates a sense of commitment and honor going both ways in marriage. And, and that's something that's lacking in cohabitation. You have to have a commitment to sort of lean into this. And when it's lived out well, when both are choosing to be all in, the Christian marriage becomes much more than just about making me happy, having my spouse meet my needs, having him pay the bills or check off my honey list or take me on vacation this year. Marriage is so much more than just making us happy. It makes us holy. And as I learn to rein in my selfish wants and desires because I belong to my husband, and as he chooses to sacrificially do the same, the thing that happens is we both grow in Christ-likeness. Because you can't simultaneously focus on yourself and make it all about you when you live daily with the idea that you belong to another person. We are humbled when we release the acts that come with belonging. It humbles us. It's humbling to tell yourself you don't belong to yourself, you belong to him, and to do the things that, that might be humbling or humiliating to serve him. But then we're also humbled when we receive those acts of kindness because he's bought into the same idea. Now, that works really well and beautifully when both are making sacrifices and both embrace this idea of belonging. And when that happens, it's a beautiful thing and it's a holy thing and it's a God-honoring thing. But you know what? We are sinners. I'm a sinful woman married to a sinful man, and if you're married, you are too. And so because we're flawed human beings, we're not going to get it right every day. And there's going to be a lot of days that we mess it up. And it's humbling for me to, to let you know that a couple of weeks ago as I was preparing this, I stepped in something and had to walk that back and just suffice it to say that God always makes me eat what I serve. When I stand up here to teach it to you, God has made me live it out first. So... The bottom line is there will be days when, when the wife is selfish and the husband is lovingly sacrificial. And then there's going to be other days when the husband makes it all about him and now it's the wife's turn to lean into the commitment even when she's not feeling the love. And on the subject of feelings, let me just say this. We women are emotional beings and feelings are and our emotions can be a beautiful thing that help us be the warm, soft, fuzzy and be nurturers and lovers. But... Feelings come and go, ladies. Commitment is the glue that holds a marriage together. It's a choice to belong. And even if you're not married right now, that's good sound wisdom for you to tuck away to share with a granddaughter that comes asking or a neighbor that may call upon you for advice. Marriage is sometimes a battleground, but commitment keeps you going. Other days, it's a playground, and isn't that fun? But always and overall, marriage is holy ground. It's the institution that God uses to teach us to be holy and to grow in selflessness in this selfie world that we live in. A mature married woman of God 
chooses some days. It's a choice to be tender and loving and forgiving, even when she doesn't feel like being tender and loving and forgiving. And that choice can jumpstart the love engine again and can bring the emotions back. It's helpful to remember, helpful for me to remember that I don't offer perfection, so I can't expect to receive it. Sometimes I write the lines and expect Kevin to read them and he has no idea there was a script and he missed it, you know? Um, it's easy to love someone who's always saying what you want said and doing what you want them to do, but life is not a fairy tale or a novel or a Hallmark movie. And if you're a married woman, you are a sinful woman married to a sinful man. Your choice to stay married and to stay committed is a testimony of your faith in the power of God. Some of you chose to make that commitment and you were betrayed. And so this subject brings up no small degree of pain. And for that, I am just so profoundly sorry. Marriage was the first institution created by God and it should be entered into seriously and very prayerfully. It should be a permanent lifelong commitment. That's a biblical view but not a popular view in today's world. In today's world, I think it's more scandalous to call off a wedding than to get a divorce. When we choose to honor our promise and our commitment, we are blessed and we are transformed and we are sanctified through, a, through the journey. Marriage brings a lot of pain and a lot of opportunities to live out the truth of our salvation and to work it out. This idea of belonging um, that, that just piqued my interest and, and had me drilling down, that might be a new one for you too. And so I hope it gives you something to think about and pray about like it did for me. And as I prayed over what belonging to my husband could look like practically, I just came up with a few ideas that I hope might give you some practical application if you're married or some practical application to discuss with a young woman that may come to you for advice who's struggling in her marriage or contemplating marriage. And so here are 10 quick things that I'll share with you, okay? Number one is, I want to know him. I want to know him. Because I belong to Kevin, I want to know him. I want to know what makes him tick, what tickles him, and what ticks him off. When I married Kevin on January 5th of 1985, I began a study of what I call Kevinology. That's the study of Kevin. And uh, I started with a high school degree. I earned my ba a BS degree, a master's degree, and I'm well on my way to a PhD 38 years later. But there's a lot left to learn. Number two, I want to make him happy. Now, we know that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And, and we know that holiness is what ultimately marriage is all about. But there's nothing wrong with the little happy thrown in. And so uh, even though uh, I, I, I'm there to, to, to seek joy and my life is, is about holiness, it's good to seek a little bit of happy in the course of a day. I want to make him laugh. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if your marriage is like mine, I'm sure it's not that different. There are some funny little inside jokes that only Kevin and I share that nobody else knows about. Those connections uh, create a bond of emotional intimacy, something that we share. I love to make my man laugh. I, I love to just say something that I know will tickle his funny bone. And when, you, and when we think about it, if you think all the way back to those years that you were dating, didn't we try to do that then? Didn't we try to be clever and funny and, and flirty? And so just because we have a ring on our finger doesn't mean we still can't be fun and, and funny all these years later. I want to know his pet peeves, you know? Um, the things that bug Kevin aren't the things that bug me and vice versa. So we can just harp on the things that bug us or we can just choose to let those things go and be grateful for the opportunity to extend grace. I want to pray for him. Ephesians 5 says that men are to submit to God and women are, submit to, are to submit to their husbands. And that passage used to kind of irritate me. I don't mind telling you. I used to call submission the S word. I have to obey him. I have to submit to him. Um, but through the years, I've come to realize we have it much harder than the men do. <clears throat> you know, submitting to a holy God who is perfect, well, that's no problem. Anything God tells you to do, you can submit to that. You can trust what that he tells you to do is, is good. But submitting to a flawed, sinful man, we have it hard. So here's the thing about it. If I have to submit to this sinner, if I have to submit to him, I'm going to pray for him. Because if I have to submit to somebody, I want him to be getting it right and making good decisions. Number six, I will praise him. I want to build him up. I want to encourage him. You know, for all our talk about the male ego, we all know there's just a soft little teddy bear boy inside there. And behind every successful man, I'm convinced there's an encouraging woman who believes in him. 
I will, I will thank him. <clears throat> Thankfulness goes a long way. If we make it our goal every single day to thank our spouse for something, I think it's going to shift the focus of our mind, and um, it's going to help us walk in gratefulness, and I think it can transform a relationship. Thankfulness, not just in a marriage, but in other relationships, can be very, very powerful. We can focus on the one thing they did wrong, or we can focus on the 99 reasons to be thankful. And so sometimes I've even caught myself just saying, okay, I'm going to name 10 things that I'm thankful for. And it just helps to sort of erase that one little irritating thing. Number eight, I will surprise him. I'll surprise him. Don't we love to be surprised? Do you love to be surprised? I do. And, and, and don't, didn't we work at it when we were trying to win the hearts of our husbands? And I, I just want to keep doing that. Leave a note in his car, or hide in his suitcase if he travels, send him an e-card, make his favorite dinner. You know, I could go on. You've got your own ideas. You know what that means to surprise someone. Why do we stop doing the things that we used to do? Number nine, I will defer to him. You don't always have to have the last word. You don't always have to have your way. Everything doesn't have to be the way that I want it. So look for ways to just let it go and to let, let it be what he wants to do. And then number 10, I will initiate sexual intimacy with him. I just thought I would add that in case you missed Paul's very clear point earlier in the passage. Now, your list may look different than mine. If the idea of a married couple belonging to one another is a new one for you, I, I hope that you might make some time this week to just think about that and to pray over that. And if you're married, to ask God to show you maybe 10 practical ways to live out this call in your life, no matter what age or stage in life you find yourself in. And if this is a concept that you are familiar with, then maybe you can just check in with the Lord and ask him to show you how you're doing and where you might be able to improve. Because here's our truth. The woman of God knows a husband and wife belong to each other, belong to each other. What could belonging look like in your life and in your marriage? Now, of course, this idea of belonging to each other is difficult enough when you've got two believers married to each other, but it's made very challenging when it's a Christian married to a non-Christian. So that was what Paul addressed next. These believers who find themselves married to non-believers, a challenge for them then, and certainly still a challenge for us today. 2 Corinthians 6.14, we'll get there next year. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Well, what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Sometimes this happens when a believer chooses to be unequally yoked and just goes ahead and marries a non-believer anyway. If you're a grandmother and you find yourself giving advice to a granddaughter who's contemplating marriage to a non-believer, or a friend giving advice to a friend, or a mother to a daughter... And, um, and, and they, they've come to, to share their heart, and what should I do? Your advice always needs to be this. Read my lips. Do not do it. I don't care if he's going to medical school. I don't care if he's from a great family, drives a nice car, has a good job, owns his own house. Don't do it. And then if she says, but I love him, your next answer should be, do you love God more? Do you love God more? If the answer is, well, I know he'll change after we're married, then you need to explain how very wrong and unfair that is. Because what if his plan is to change you? A marriage must be entered into with honesty and integrity. We have to have courage to share the truth and choose the way of truth before marriage. But once you say, I do, and once you're married then that believer has to work to make that marriage work. Sometimes one spouse becomes a believer after marriage, and that's most likely the case of what happened here in the first century that prompted the question to Paul. But either way, whether the conversion took place before the marriage or whether the believer chose to marry an unbeliever, the answer is the same according to this passage, stay married. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, 12b-13, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. Paul goes on to share that through the godly example of the believing spouse, it's even possible that that unbelieving spouse may be won over to the Lord and that there will be blessings that flow to the unbelieving spouse and the children through that godly influence of the Christian spouse. The bottom line truth is this. The woman of God knows believers are to stay married to unbelievers. This truth may be true that we're to accept 
It may be truth that we, are, we will be ready to share when called upon to give counsel to others. But this is God's word. This is the word of the Lord. And then finally, Paul addresses believers who are not married. And he says this, Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. So Paul sees singleness as a blessing. He explains later in this chapter that being unmarried frees up a believer to be concerned only with the Lord's appra- the, the, the concerns of the Lord, uh, the, the Lord's affairs, but a married person has to be concerned about his spouse and taking care of his family, and so he's divided. And so I love how Paul says in verse 7 that, that both marriage and singleness are a gift, a gift. And so can we see singleness as a gift? And can we see marriage as a gift? I think there are those of us that have rejected the gift of marriage, just saying, I just want to remain single. And there are those that have rejected the gift of singleness, choosing instead to rush into marriage. And how could it change our attitude if we see both as a gift? So when we see our marital status as a gift from God, I think it does bring freedom and peace. We don't have to make decisions based upon cultural norms or economics or even family expectations that should dictate our choices. We only have to look to God. The woman of God knows that both marriage and singleness are gifts from God. Marriage is a gift and singleness is a gift. Even Jesus himself said that. We looked at that passage in Matthew this week, remember, where Jesus said, to whom it has been given. And I I think even from that, we can infer that, that that it is a gift. And so our beliefs about marriage and sexuality should come from ladies from the word of God and not from the culture or from our favorite TV show or from self, some self-help book or some popular blogger on the internet. We can get opinions from all sorts of places in the modern day. But what we have to do is open our Bibles and we have to look here for the answers to the questions that we have and for the beliefs that we hold about marriage and singleness and sexuality and everything else. All those other outside influences and voices need to fade into the background as we allow the Bible to come front and center and dictate what we believe and the actions and the choices we will make. Everything we believe about everything must come from the Word of God. The beliefs of the culture they're going to come and go. The cultural values are going to swing like a pendulum, but God's word stands forever. Isaiah 40 verse 8 confirms, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yes. Ladies, let's pray. God Almighty, I pray that our identity would be found in the person of Jesus Christ, not in our marital status, not in the things that have been done to us or the things that we have done to others. We are grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I just pray that we would be strong women of God who do not feel that we have to compromise the truth, but we will stand for the truth and we will know what the Bible says, but we will always serve it up with truth, but with grace and with love, and with calmness, and with an allegiance to the truth. God, we are amazed as we look back and study the first century that there is nothing new under the sun, that we, we are sinners. They were sinners then. We are sinners now. And all of it points us back to the foot of the cross, to our need for the gospel, how grateful we are for the gospel that changes everything. Jesus, thank you for your obedience to come to earth, to die for us. Help us to live for you to live for the truth always and always and to live to be women of God who allow the word of God to dictate our choices and our thoughts and the advice and counsel that we share. For your glory and in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.